stuff in there but we don't we don't eat super heavy in the morning yeah um even though i know you're kind of supposed to we don't you know, yeah it's, um, cool well let's get into this but, i'm like i'm super curious to talk to you because i want to start a side project and this is it basically um cool providing a voice given my history with superfoods um for the last seven years which is crazy um but just talking to athletes nutritionists chefs and um you know giving that voice for nutrition but also just food in general so i'm glad that you can you know support me and uh enjoy me for the first one yeah absolutely i'm stoked sweet dude. To be a part of it so i you know i have to say uh I checked out um, Bibian's TED Talk recently about mentality, and yeah, that yeah. Um, I'm sorry for your loss, man. Uh, as as a friend of her, you know, as a friend of yours. Um, yeah, I greatly appreciate that. She's yeah, super rad person. Yeah, um, it's interesting though because it's it plays perfectly into what I want to do with this and her message, which was just to never stop dreaming, you know, and to follow your passion. Um, and this is kind of you know this is kind of it, you know, like had a journalism degree in college and, you know, helping people out through food, um, has always been a passion of mine. So it's like, kind of just goes hand in hand. It's weird how things align, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I feel you. I mean, chasing the dreams, like that's one of those things. It's like, I mean, I always dreamed of being a professional snowboarder, but I like never planned on it. Sure. You know, it just kind of fell into my lap. It was never something that I like expected so like I, I and then once it came around i was like oh this is an option like okay let's go for it yeah you know so and like can you just kind of introduce like you know snowboarding x and like what that is real quick yeah border cross yeah border cross yeah so border cross sbx snowboard cross however you want to define it or whatever you want to call it i should say uh it's essentially like the best way i can describe it is it's like motocross, but on snowboards. Yep. You know, you, you line up in a gate with multiple other people. You go down the crazy course, first one of the bottom wins. You know, you got jumps, rollers, whoops, berms. Plus, you got a couple other guys on snow, you know, jockeying for position and, and trying to beat you to the bottom. So uh, that's the best way I can I can really describe it. You know, it's 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 a wild beast. It's It's something like especially in terms of snowboarding, it's something in and of its own. It's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, it's super fun. It's wild to watch. If you're, if you're into like NASCAR and things like that, you like seeing big crashes, it's definitely worthwhile to, to tune in once in a while. Cause it, it can get pretty hairy sometimes. Yeah. And the, I mean, the camera angles, I mean, they're, they're right with you the entire time. Oh yeah. And I mean, take it to X games, for example. I mean, they've fiddled around with multiple different ways of doing it and, you know, they have the the camera that's on essentially a wire that goes with you. And then sometimes they'll have, you know, a drone overhead. And, and um, I want to say maybe it was 2015, they had this massive drone. I mean, huge, right? And it's just hovering over the first jump as you, so you come off this drop, <laughs> drop in, which is like a 10 foot ledge into a drop in three rollers and then like a 60 foot jump, I think something like that. And it's just hovering there. And I'm sitting there going, I might run into that thing. I might hit it, you know, like I hope these guys know what they're doing. Cause I might actually launch into that thing. And of course, you know, they, they had the exact height of where they needed to be. So no one could hit them. And, but it was just like kind of unnerving. I'm standing there in the start gate kind of looking at it. Like, okay, I guess, I guess we're going to go for it. I, I mean, yeah, know. you're not, it, you're not practicing with that in mind. No, no. Well, and I mean, for the most part, when you actually practice on the course, it's not around. They might have it for a minute or two to take a couple shots, but otherwise, like, you know, you're getting follow cam footage and head cam footage and stuff like that. Like the last thing you're thinking is, oh, wait, there's going to be a drone hovering above the first big jump in the course, you know? So yeah. pretty funny, but like super cool the way they're able to, you know, set up and, and get the action where the action is going to happen. You know, it's, it's really cool. I mean, without having a follow camera on course, you know, it's the, it's, it's the best way to do it. And if you had a follow camera on course, who knows if they'd one, be able to keep up and two end up, you wouldn't want them in to end up in the mix, you know? Yeah. So you just, I mean, you just won double gold, right? In Italy. That's insane. Congratulations. But like, Thank you. yeah, I mean, is the technology, does it travel internationally? Regarding? Regarding drones regarding everything that you would have in the States? 
Uh, you know, so, I mean, every venue is different that, you know, like take it back here to, to Aspen where, where, you know, X Games is held, you know, there's massive restrictions for airspace. You know, there's an airport literally less than a, less than a quarter mile from the venue. So uh, every, every venue is a little bit different, whether or not you can have a drone even in the air, depending on the country and all that kind of stuff. That's, you know, that's, stuff that's way above my pay grade. I sure. know at, um, in Italy, they did have a couple drones getting footage of, of um, you know, the races and the trainings and all that kind of stuff. I actually have no idea who was flying the drone. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I've only seen one or two pictures from the drone, which was the day we did the um, memorial to Bibian. Wow. Okay. That's, wow. So when you're, you know, the point of this is to highlight food are you are you able to enjoy you know Italian cuisine while you're there, or do you have to stay to the strict diet? I mean, so strict diet, you know, it's it's weird because like, well, first of all, let me just answer the question. Yes, yeah. I can. Um, I have to be a little bit careful though because I do have celiac. One yeah. thing I've realized though with that is like when I go over to Europe, there's certain things that I can eat over there that I definitely cannot eat here. Um, you know, and pasta is one of the things that I just stay away from completely, whether I'm in Europe or in the U S or wherever I'm at it, that seems to affect me the most. Um, but I can get away with, you know, some croissants and, and some, some forms of, of breaded materials, whether, you know, have a slice or two of pizza and it doesn't seem to affect me if at all. So, um, yeah, I, I can, I can enjoy a little bit of it. You know, my big thing is, is sweets. I have a really bad sweet tooth. And yeah. so like when I'm in Europe, especially Italy, you know, gelato ice cream is my all time. It's my all time thing. Like I, especially sweets, snacks, treats, whatever, like ice cream. So gelato, I mean, that's, that's my jam. So yeah, I, you know, I partake in that, yeah. you know, uh, uh, but it's, it's, you know, you gotta be, it's, it's always a balance, right? Sure. If you, if you go heavy with certain things and you need to go lighter another day and maybe heavy with, other things like vegetables. So if you're going heavy on, say you are a pasta or rice eaters or, or uh, breads and that sort of stuff, plus some sweets some sugars, you know, always balance it out with some vegetables. Um, you know, and over in Italy, I mean, the food's amazing. So yeah, it's always, it's always a fine line that you're walking there, but just in Europe in general, I love all the food over there. Yeah. So I don't How long have you had celiacs for? When were you diagnosed with that? You know, I found out in, had to have been 2011 okay 2011 or 2012 wow. I think it was 2011 uh, I just had massive stomach issues for a long time you know we'll leave out all the details but of course, um, yeah <laughs> you know it finally just one day I was in a I wasn't actually having a good day I was having a bit of a bad day and I was like out of spite I went to the doctor I was like I'm gonna find out what's going on with my stomach like well I think it, at some levels I just needed some sort of accomplishment for the day. Um, but also like it had been bothering me for so long and I realized how much it was affecting my mood and just always being in pain. Wow. Uh, I, I went to the doctor and, and sure enough, they're like, well, you know, let's run some tests, everything, you know, um, coming back, they're like, Oh, you have celiac. Wow. So, and I mean, this was, this was back before I even knew like gluten-free things even existed. Um, and, and I had just kind of, started hearing about it i really didn't know what it was or anything like that i mean i didn't even know gluten-free bread existed for the first three or four months and um toast like my roommates would make toast in in the morning and stuff like that and waffles and i mean my i mean my mouth would just water and you'd think toast like yeah it's got a good smell to it but you wouldn't expect it to be like this thing that you like all of a sudden you're craving and really wanting and for whatever reason depriving myself of of that stuff all of a sudden my brain was like you need that you want it and I, it was just so hard to get past and then some one day i was talk i was actually talking about it with someone and they were like you know there's gluten-free bread right <laughs> and i was like what no and i kind of find out you know at the time there was like three different brands maybe and they weren't great but i was like i don't even care like give me some toast that was the first thing i did when i found out i went home threw it in threw it in the um my own toaster because i had to buy my own toaster and um and just chow down. I was yeah. like, this is amazing. You know, have so. the offerings gotten better since then? 
Oh, them. absolutely. Nice. And I mean, it's not just not just here in the United States. You know, you see like places like you'd never really expect it, like New Zealand um, yeah. has they've got a wide variety and every restaurant you go to now, um, you know, they have an entirely different menu. Most, most places, almost every place. Whereas like I went to New Zealand in like 2012 or something like that. And, um, there was nothing I could, I could only eat like fruits, vegetables and, and meats. And that was about it. And I had to stay away from everything. Wow. And then, um, yeah. And then I went back in 2017 and it completely changed. I mean, different menu at most of the places, like if it's a decent restaurant, the, you know, the chef will come out and have a conversation with you and really see where you're at. If there's any fine lines you can walk and all that kind of stuff. And, um, so you, you definitely, the world has embraced it. I think everyone realized it is kind of a problem, but, um, the, the variety of things nowadays is, is unimaginable. I mean, they got Oreos, not wow. Oreo brand, but they got Oreo cookies and, a, a, you know, if you're if you're a guy like me with sweet tooth it's like bro give me yeah, those cookies exactly i'm the same way i wish i had a savory tooth but it's sweet all the way i just can't I know. yeah I'm, I'm in la right now i'm doing a nomad life and and for the year and i love it out here i want to stay out here long term but like if it says you know art, artisan bakery i am all over it uh, <laughs> and i just i can't stop myself it's crazy uh, you're lucky you can you can dive in there face yeah first. <laughs> exactly exactly right um, so, I mean, at this event, like going back to your diet, do you, do you travel with product? Like, do you travel with food just to stay on top of stuff or how does that work? You know, so you got to be careful with your weight, with baggage. Yeah. You know, when you're flying international, you're allowed anywhere from one to three bags, depending on your status with the airlines and yeah. that sort of stuff. And then obviously if you're bringing food products from one country to another, you, there's, there's obviously a fine line you walk there, but, sure. um, you know, I, I travel with certain things. I don't go too crazy. I know that like, generally speaking, I can find what I need to get me by if I have to. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I take some supplements and some products with me just to, just to be sure. Yeah. Can you share what you're taking on a daily basis? Yeah. So, I mean, um, supplement wise, you know, for, for recovery and that sort of thing, you know, primarily, pri uh, protein, creatine, that sort of thing, you yeah. know, um, you know, to stay up on, on, um, you know, mood, mental wellness, that sort of thing. You know, I do take a uh, vitamin D supplement I, just being up in the mountains, winter, winter athlete, all that sort of stuff. I mean, before the pandemic, I mean, everything was covered anyway. I mean, your nose might stick out and that's about it. So you're not really absorbing a ton of vitamin D. So I have to stay up on that. Um, I, I generally take some turmeric with me. Um, I love cacao. It's always nice. Yeah. Um, if I can, some acai powder, yeah. some beetroot. Um, what else? What do you notice yes. with beetroot? Because that's been, I mean, that's like, I've been, I remember hearing about it years ago for stamina. And then also mm -hmm. it's, I don't know where it really, where it's at in the stage of it's like, you know, life, you know, if it's life in the, in, you know, sports um, or even the world. But like, what do you notice or what do you see with that? I mean, energy and stamina is probably the biggest thing. It seems yeah. to help a little bit with inflammation and that sort of stuff. It's hard to say if it's directly the beetroot or something else, sure, uh, like the turmeric or something like that. Um, it doesn't taste bad. Yeah, I don't really notice a ton of flavor with it one way or the other, good or bad. Sure. Um, so that's always nice. Um, I just figure, you know, if everyone's talking about it and it and it's in in the mix of conversation of things that could potentially be good for you or healthy for you like hey let's try it and yeah. i have to be honest like all praise goes to my wife when it comes to my diets because i have about the shortest attention span on the planet and so uh <laughs> she's really good at doing the research side of things and i tell her kind of what i'm interested in and then three days later she's like okay so here's what i found you know <laughs> she goes deep into into the research side of things and if I want to try a diet change, I would like to call it a diet change, not a diet because really a diet's just your intake anyway. Right. So yeah. if I want to try to change my diet a little bit, I let her know what I'm, what I'm interested in, what I'm thinking, where I think the benefits will be and all that, you know, the plus and the negatives with it. And then, you know, she does a ton of research on it and then tells me like, Hey, like that might be actually a, a, a good option for you. Um, 
and then she kind of helps create some some dishes and meals and and a little bit of, of the meal planning for me because I again like if I if it were left up to me it would last for about two or three days and then I would just be yeah. off the rails again you know I love it. <laughs> so, so Heather reached out um, to me recently about some superfoods I hope that what she has going on, on the side works out man Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's exciting times. Yeah, yeah, we're we're super stoked to to move forward with it. We're not Sweet. quite ready to drop drop yeah. the the news, but um, you know, we we hope to be in full full swing by, you know, the beginning of June. Awesome. Um, and so between now and June, you know, we'll let the world know what we're doing, but I love um it. yeah, we really appreciate all the help. Yeah, um, of course. And, and all the information. I love it. Um, so you like you discovered snowboarding around 2000 is that right so yeah yeah i mean snow sports i i've been involved in snow sports since about 96 97 okay um but i i mean i i knew about snowboarding from the very beginning okay i didn't get to put my feet in a snowboard till about 99 2000 okay um you know i come from let's back up a little bit. So when I first went and, and lived with my dad, I was about 12 years old, okay. um, had no, no opportunities to ski or snowboard up until that point came from a very humble background. Um, at points, you know, living with my mom, we were homeless, all that kind of stuff, uh, living in and out of homeless shelters, eating out of soup kitchens, that sort of stuff. Let's put it this way. Diet was the furthest thing from anything. It was like, if it was edible, you're eating it kind of deal. Yeah. Um, Maslow's higher but, um, needs. Right, right. Just live. Yeah. Just stay alive. Kind exactly. Of deal. Um, so I went and lived with my dad uh, when I was 12 after some traumatic events that happened there in Oregon. And, uh, you know, literally the day he picked me up from the airport, he took me to Deer Valley and put skis on my feet. He was already, you know, they were doing like a little staycation, him and my, my step family. So, um, yeah, I started skiing literally that day. I was, again, I was 12. It must have been right around 96, I think, 96, 97 that year. And my dad's an old school guy, you know, kind of with that attitude of like, no snow, no, no son of mine is going to be a snowboarder, like ski these snowboarders or whatever. And um, big skier. So, you know, I skied and he, his attitude was like, you want to ski, I'll pay for it. Like, whatever you want to do with skiing, like pay for your skis, pay for your pass, whatever you want to snowboard you're paying for that crap yourself. So, you know, once I was old enough to get a job and a couple paychecks put together, you know, they went towards a snowboard setup. That was like the first thing. And I mean, I instantly fell in love with it. It was something that I always wanted to do. It just looked so fun. It was technology was quite a bit different back then. And, you know, snowboarders were floating on the power skiers were, you know, up to their, up to their elbows, up to their armpits. And it was much harder to, to ski pow than it was to snowboard pow. And that was kind of my big appeal that time, you know, Jeremy Jones, and some of these other guys had done some stuff where it really, uh, you know, showcasing what the potential was of big mountain riding and all that. So it was a huge appeal to me. Um, yeah. So I got a snowboard and just took to it like fish to water, really, you know, first day I was linking turns, I was crashing here and there, but I was having a blast doing it and just fell in love with it. You know, I love it. Um, when I first started, yeah. we were in pads too. Like I, just cause I mean, my back was killing me or like my knees. So I would, I would shot myself with like knee pads, wrist pads, all that stuff. Um, oh no. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't it. even have them for, for biking or, or, yeah. or skateboarding or anything else. Like back <laughs> yeah. then it wasn't like, like if you wore a helmet on the mountain, like you were like one of two guys back then, you know, wow. whereas now if you don't wear a helmet, you're like one of two or three guys on the mountain. Yeah. Guys. It's changed a little um, bit, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So body armor and that kind of stuff was like the furthest thing from my mind. And, you That's know, hilarious. I was a little reckless anyway, so I didn't even think about it. Yeah. And then you had your, your accident, your industrial accident, right? Which I kind of love like your mentality about it. It was just like, I, I, you know, I've, I had, you know, it was like what blood clots, right. Um, you know, um, transfusions, right. Um, hyperbolic treatments right is that all accurate yeah so 2005 um uh, by that point you know between yeah i was sophomore or something in high school when i started snowboarding and then 2005 you know at that point i had you know graduated high school got a job as a well driller drilling for water um and moved through the ranks pretty quickly with that company and then um was just doing my thing i got hurt what was it, June? 
sorry i'm trying to think no, june 17 2005 sorry i was just thinking about it. it's been so long um, yeah june, june 17 2005 i got i i got injured and it was just a freak accident got my foot caught in some hydraulics and uh 2000 pounds worth of pressure for over 15 minutes 200 breaks and fractures in my foot which that part of the body i think has 26 bones something like that wow so a lot you know they rebuilt it seven or eight hours i think they rebuilt the whole thing and then i had to be lifelighted this was in utah i had to be lifelighted from logan utah to wow. salt lake city uh where i spent the next couple of weeks in a trauma unit and um you know long story short yeah i had multiple blood transfusions every time i'd sit up past a 45 degree angle blood would come kind of geysering out of that out of that hole in the top of my foot that they had cut to kind of rebuild everything and um a bleed out or whatever and uh, you know gone i think the third or fourth time i was gone somewhere in the range of about three minutes you know so pretty lucky that they were able to bring me back and and at that point it was like doctors like you have to stay flat on your back you're using wow. a bedpan you're not moving like stay on your back and so at the, during all of that process they were putting me in a hyperbaric chamber you know two three times a day just trying to increase blood flow to to that part of my body and Sure enough, within a couple of weeks after all of that happening, um, they pretty much sent me home, said, your foot's dying, you've lost circulation, there's not a lot we can do at this point, go home, watch your foot die, decide what you want to do. Uh, did you know immediately after, though, like, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but did you know oh, that, did you know immediately, like, this love for snowboarding was so strong that I was going to do whatever it took to get back out there as soon as possible? Not really, no, okay. so like... You know, the day after they released me, I started having chest pains, ended up realizing that I had a blood clot in my left lung that was trying to pass to my heart. So uh, at that point, it was just stay alive. Okay. You know, it wasn't, it was, there was nothing snowboarding. And, but after a couple of weeks sitting at my house, watching my foot die, having a lot of time to think about everything, it was like, what do I want to get back to doing? Obviously, I want to get back to work as quick as possible. That was like, you know, that was what I was doing. That was my career path. I had a lot of uh, early on success. Plus I was, I was in route for some, some more success. And uh, so that was my big thing. And then the other thing, I had a lot of time to think about it in the season prior to that, I snowboarded twice all season. Oh, wow. And it was because I was standing on a drill rig all the time. And when you're in a drill on a drill rig with water coming down on you and it's 10 degrees outside, the last thing you want to do is go out and be in the cold and play in it. And, um, so I'd snowboarded like twice that season. It really kind of hit me like, you know, that's, that's my heart and soul. That's my church. That's what's got me through everything so far up until this point. Like I want to get back to that. And uh, so when the doctor called me in and kind of weighed out the options for me, he was like, yo, like you don't have a whole lot of options here, chop it off or try to save it chase gangrene to the hip possibly if it doesn't kill you chop it off anyway five six surgeries we might be able to save a small portion of it and that's kind of when I was like you know how long till I can snowboard again like that that question was just kind of eating at me and he, he he's like you know if we try to save it you know the partial limb salvage five six surgeries that stuff you're looking at if ever you know 10 years wow. if ever and so that's all I really heard and I was like well what if we just cut to the chase and chop the thing off sounds like that's the way we're headed he said you know if you try to save it, you're always going to have a, a pretty massive disability. If we try to, if we just chop it off, technology is good. You're a healthy guy, great attitude, athletic. You'd be living a normal life with a prosthesis three years. And I said, snowboarding? And he said, totally. And I said, all right, opening day in, is in October. It's July now. Like, what do you think? Three months? And he's like, dude, whatever's going to make you make the right decision. <laughs> That's it. what I was like, all right, chop it off. Wow. So a week later we did, you know, and that was when I set that goal immediately that, that day at the, having that conversation, I was like, I'm going to snowboard. And yeah. It's funny how it all turned out. You know, I told anybody with a set of ears that I was going to snowboard and most people didn't really believe me at the time. I mean, you're looking at this guy on crutches, legs wrapped in bandages, cho you know, chopped off at the, at the calf. And, um, people were like, okay, dude, cool story. Like, don't, don't, don't be bummed if it doesn't happen. Like yeah. we support you, but. And, uh, yeah, you know, that was, that was it. I was the driving force be behind everything, getting off the meds, teaching myself how to walk, no physical therapy or rehab, by the way, it was just wow. me, you know? Um, but that's what was pushing me forward every day. It was like, oh, I'm going to snowboard again. I'm going to snowboard again. And sure enough, you know, 
Brighton opening day, October 31st, 2005. We were up there. Wow. You know, we got, that, got a couple laps in. So. That's wild. And how was the transition? Were you, like, you know, from, you know, prior to having, you know, being Paralympic, like, could you know, like, what were the differences you noticed basically with your new setup? Well, I mean, there's a lot. I, okay. The original setups, I mean, just pr technology alone, like uh, the feet that I was using were made for like walking and like some minimal activity, like playing basketball or something like that, but nothing like super high impact, nothing that would really test the, the strengths. And so that was one of the things I noticed the most was we were doing a lot of trial and error. I was snapping feet left and right. And what we ended up settling on was a foot that was my size, but the strength um, of someone the size of Shaq pretty wow. much you could put Shaq in this foot and he could dunk and come down on top of it and it wouldn't shatter underneath him wow. and we realized you know me at, at you know 160 170 pounds the forces that I was coming down with were that of someone the size of Shaq you know or or even bigger and so we had to make really stiff feet that would just pretty much take take a beat down um, and I, I mean, you're stuck in the back seat a lot of the time because there was a lot of concepts that I really wasn't familiar with, like forward lean and wedging and all this other stuff. But um, other than that, I mean, I was I figured, hey, I'm strapping into a board. How hard can it be? You know, and it wasn't the most beautiful thing. It was a lot of skidded turns and that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, we made it happen and, and kind of adapted to what what I had to work with. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Um, so, I mean, we met at X games and that was 2015. I believe it was, it was, I mean, that was like, what an awesome weekend we had. It was just like, I mean, out of, out of a dream, to be honest, like being in the athlete lounge, talking to everyone and everyone was just so cool. I don't know. It was, it feels like a lifetime ago. It's, it's oh, crazy. Yeah. I mean, so my first X games was actually 2012, uh, cool. but we were only exhibition, you know, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a, a true event. Yeah. I mean, we got prize purse, but no medals. Um, and it was just kind of to showcase what this, the sport was capable of. I think the year before they gave them medals, but no prize purse. Um, and it was just, again, the first two times that para was, was um, showcasing snowboarding for, for X games. It was simply that just exhibition, um, yeah. which was cool though. I mean, it, so going into it in 2015, I mean, a lot had happened between 2012 and 2015, obviously, you know, uh, I went to the games, uh, went to Sochi, won a bronze medal. Um, and I was much healthier where I yeah. was at 2012. I mean, I was eating airheads and drinking Mountain Dew. Wow. That's wild. <laughs> you know, my diet consisted of pizza and ice cream every night uh burgers fries all that kind of stuff and then 2015 like i had kind of already taken that that role of let's get myself in healthy let's be an athlete if you're going to claim to be an athlete you need to be one kind of deal it's, that that was that was my mentality for it and so what triggered that though really getting our sport into Sochi. Okay. It, it was, a, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning, Bibian. Yeah. Bibian, myself, Amy Purdy, a long list of athletes, Mike Shea, Evan Strong, um, Carl Murphy, uh, Tyler, uh, oh, his name, sorry, Canadian guy. Mm. Anyway, we had all like spent a lot of time begging, pleading, trying to get our sport into the games, you know, and we had finally, we had finally done it, you know, and I literally got a phone call, I want to say, you know, like 18 months out from the games, and was like, hey, congratulations, your sports, your sports gonna, gonna be in Sochi, better get it ready, get yourself ready, and so, you know, between that and then finding out I had celiac, it all happened really quickly. Um, I was just like, you know, I want to get myself in the best shape possible. And at the time, I was about 215. You know, 5'11", mm -hmm. that's kind of hefty. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I was a bigger guy. Um, and so instantly, I was like, I'm going to eat clean. I'm going to cut out the soda. I'm going to cut out the candy and just see where I can get. And it became like, almost like an obsession. Like it, I just, it, it was like, let's see how far we can go with this as healthy as possible. And so, you know, instantly I was in the gym two to four hours a day. I was biking to the gym. Uh, didn't even have a car at the time. So it was better than taking the bus. Yeah. And, uh, it was friendly for my time. Too. 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And uh, yeah, carbon footprints, everything. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, like, it, it was a sustainable way to get to the, the gym. Um, but it also cut down the gym time. I didn't have to spend all that time doing cardio because I just did it. Yeah. Uh, but then I was eat, like I said, I was eating clean and, and I went from 215. And then when I competed in Sochi, I was like 164. Wow. Something like that. And that, that was within a year and a half. Um, so I lost quite a bit of weight, but I mean, I was cut, you know, as, and I, I lost a little too much weight because yeah. gravity sports weight is fast kind of deal. Um, but I kind of just jumped on that gravy train of like, let's, let's get as healthy as possible, do as much research as, as we can stand and try to figure out the best way, you know, and get myself in, in the best shape possible. And going into 2015, going into those games, I mean, I had put on from, from Sochi to X games, I put on maybe five seven maybe eight pounds something like that wow. um, so I wasn't much heavier you know uh, and competing against guys that are over 200 pounds and you know uh, some hover around 230 240 maybe even more uh, it, it's a huge disadvantage being that light sure and um, but that was the big thing that was the big spark was like okay if you're gonna call yourself an athlete you need to live like an athlete you need to look like an athlete you need to be an athlete yeah and border crossers we have a different body type than say like your super pipers and your slope style guys you know they're generally not all of them but most of them are a little bit smaller uh, um, built just in general they're really agile really acrobatic whereas border crossers have a tendency to be bigger like almost i i like to call us the jock of snowboarding you know you just kind of swole a lot of the time or whatever yeah uh, but it's a fine balance too yeah. yeah, I would imagine. I mean, were you doing this research research about, you know, healthier living on your own or were you with Heather at the time? So I met Heather in 2014, just okay. after the games. I went and lived at the Olympic Training Center. Awesome. Uh, and so prior to that, I was just doing things on my own, whatever I could find on, on the internet and trying yeah. to avoid fad diets, but also taking that into consideration because I feel like there's good information everywhere. You just can't when you can't believe everything you read, everything you hear, but you also have to kind of take bits and pieces and figure out what works best for you. Cause I always say nobody is the same and no body is the same. You know, yeah, everyone correct. has a slight different structure to them. So it, for me, it was, what can I find that seems good? What has research behind it? What has, you know, proven, proven itself over time. And then let's, let's make a mixture of it. Yeah. It's just kind of a hybrid. I learned that recently the hard way. I did like some blood level testing um, and I was trying to just get more protein in my diet um, and was drinking a lot of whole fat milk and my cholesterol levels were through the roof recently in my last test. And I have since then just gone to more plant-based than ever before. Um, and I feel okay. great. Um, but I also think, you know, to your point, it's like, it's all that, but then it's like, how do you feel? Like, how is your mindset? You know, how do what does your body feel like? And I don't know. It just, it feels good. I'm sure that felt good to you too, huh? Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. and uh, funny you mentioned plant-based cause I go, I have a tendency to go the other direction. I go really? more of like a carnivorous higher fat diet yeah. uh, for me, but I tried plant-based for a while and I actually personally felt sluggish and I felt, you know, kind of foggy brained a little bit and that sort of stuff. And then, um, I tried, you know, keto diet for, I did it for about seven, eight months, something wow. like that. And the effects for me, I noticed were exactly what you were, what you were describing was, yeah. uh, you know, almost a state of euphoria a lot of times, which yeah. was kind of crazy for me, you know, and I was thinking sharp, quick, fast, um, no depression, you know, I suffer from, from depression and, and, wow. um, and a bit of anxiety and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, having those, I swear, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to explain, but I, extreme sports athletes, we have these huge spikes in endorphins. And then when you're not around it for a little while, you, you know, you get down in this level that you're not used to being in all the time. And, um, so I found like when I'm in that funk, you know, I'm constantly, trying to find things that will uh, get me back up into those spiked levels so that I have that excitement in my life, I guess. And, and those are very basic and broad terms, but 
really, you know, we live in that level of like higher than most all the time. And then when you don't have it, like my depression seems to be astronomically high and yeah. it's, it's hard to get out of it sometimes. But what I notice with higher fats, you know, especially taking, you know, my omegas and all that kind of stuff, that's another thing supplement wise and, and, um, superfood wise that I'm always looking to get, um, it balances me out. It's not that I'm like beaming all the time. There is times where I'm definitely in that euphoric state. It feels like, but it just levels me out. So I can have a normal conversation with someone. I can think on my toes. I can react to situations, good and bad or whatever, or high intense situations like on my mountain bike or on my snowboard and stuff. The downside for me going the keto direction was I lost a ton of weight. I mm. spent four years trying to put 20 pounds on between Sochi and Pyeongchang. And then all of a sudden I was losing all of this weight and like, sure, I looked great, but weight's fast where yeah. I'm at, you know? So it's a fine balance. And like, what, how much weight can make up how much speed? Like what's the ratio to that? That's a great question. I mean, it all depends on the athlete themselves, how agile they are. Okay. If they're able to get the most out of every feature, you can take a guy who's, you know, 135, 140, and they can be competitive, competitive against a guy who's 180, 190. But in all reality, you know, 50 pounds makes a huge difference. And that guy at 135, 140, 145, they are working so much harder. And once you start getting into flat sections, um, something that's not super technical, where it's just strictly, you know, um, uh, gravity, drag all that kind of stuff there that that weight advantage is just going to pull them away i mean and i've seen it with guys that are on the much bigger side they'll be standing straight up wow. they'll have baggy clothes on and they're pulling away from me at one 175 180 you know uh, just pulling away and i'm in a tuck and at that point i really don't think it's their wax and that kind of stuff that's doing it for them because we all have some of the best wax techs on the planet you know yeah. so like uh, it really, you know, I do believe it has something to do with, with, um, you know, the, the mechanics at, at, or the forces at be, if you will. Um, yeah. it, it, I don't know the exact ratio though. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I know that a 50 pound difference is massive and it's that guy that's on the lighter end of that 50 pound scale is definitely gonna have to work way harder. Yeah. Can you see a difference, whether it be on course or even like when you're not racing, between someone who nourishes themselves and, and who doesn't beyond weight. Oh, yeah. Okay. What does that look yeah, like? Yeah. Because so in a day of, of racing, I mean, you're on the, you're at the course somewhere in the range of like seven, 8 AM kind of deal. And you probably don't step foot off of there until two or 3 PM. If you're lucky, sometimes even longer. Uh, Pyeongchang was much longer because we had gate malfunctions. Mm. Um, and so we were sitting in the sun, just baking and frying and trying to stay shaded. And you're on the mountain with snow that's reflecting snow, uh, sun back at you, UV rays and all that. So it's just taking from you. If there's wind, there's weather. I mean, it all plays a factor, right? Sure. So, um, you see it though, with the guys who don't eat very healthily, like, or, or, they don't nourish themselves well, like they just run out of fuel, you yeah. know, because generally you have one or two training runs in the morning just to kind of warm up, get used to the, how the course is set. And then uh, you go into time trials and from there you'll have one to three runs depending on, depending on the setup. So, okay. um, and then from there you go into heat to get bracketed. So then you might have four to eight more laps <laughs> depending on the race structure. So, and the amount of athletes and all of that. Uh, and so you need to be prepared. You need to have the right fuel and you got to have the right levels of carbs, the right levels of fats, the right level of sugars, you know, and hydration is huge. And then also, you know, you got to make sure that your body isn't getting inflamed throughout the day and all of that, because that will slow you down as well. So you definitely see it. The guys that, that aren't nourishing themselves well, uh, they seem to get fatigued way quicker. You know, in Italy, we, we dealt with some pretty high temperatures. It wasn't super long days, but we were dealing with tons of high, like the, the temperatures were very high and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the snow was soft, which made it, you know, it's just more work at that point. And I felt like just watching those, those guys who weren't nourished, you know, they started to slow down when it really mattered. It's like, great. You just, you just qualified. Well, great. Uh, you just moved through three, three brackets and now you're in the, the big final. 
you're shooting for a gold medal and you're you're tanking you know you're you're crashing hard and i mean not physically but your your energy is crashing you can see it in them they're slower out of the gate they're they're feet are moving slower um they're not reacting as quickly to what's happening in front of them if someone's in front of them and they got to make a reaction um so you definitely see it you see it all the time i I I think it's one of the things that's always it's emphasized with teams but i don't know if it's taken seriously by the athlete always it's hard it's hard as an athlete too because you're out there you kind of treat it like well not everybody but some people treat it kind of like a vacation it's like oh i'm in italy i want to try this and i want to try that and i want to have this beer whatever and you know drink or no drink i don't really care do your thing but um to me it's like oh you know like that's just something that's not helping you yeah i mean it's a friend of mine years ago go for it oh go ahead no it's all good i was just gonna say a friend of mine a, a year years and years ago said does it help you be a better athlete we were talking about some stuff and i was like kind of think about and he's like if the answer is no then don't do it yeah if the answer is yes keep doing it you know it was that simple i mean i was gonna say it's hard as a human just because i mean i get you know as a casual you know just like i get cravings if anything and it's like the next day you'll feel it or you know we're not training or we're not competing so it's like i feel like our competition is like maybe looks you know competing against other people so i'm guilty of that where it's like you know but it's just tough to keep that mindset of like, I got to stay healthy. Um, cause if I don't, it could be like a, a slide where you just keep going down, you know, and it just gets out of control. I don't know. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's just tough, man. Well, I'm a foodie. I yeah, can't, me I can't too. deny that. I love things that taste good. I, and I love savory too. Don't get me wrong. A sweet tooth is, is definitely a thing I've got, but the savory is, is big as well. And, um, I can, I, I understand addictive personalities and stuff. you know, I personally don't drink because I can't drink. If I do, if I have one, I have 30 and I understand that. So I just stay away from it completely. Yeah. So I understand the, the, that mentality of like, maybe I didn't have a good day. So I'm going to, I'm going to drink the pain away for me. It's I'm going to eat the pain away kind of deal. Yeah. Um, and that's, I'm an emotional eater. It's true. I can't deny it. It's, it's a tough thing to, to come to terms with it's like, wait, do I really need this? It's, you know, 10 and 11 o'clock at night, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's like, no, I just had a bad day and this is delicious. It's making me <laughs> feel so better just cause it's so good. So I understand that. Um, yeah. and then people want to celebrate as well, you know, and that goes both food and we'll just use alcohol as an example. Some people want to have a couple beers to, to celebrate, but you know, studies show that alcohol can be found in your system upwards 30 days after, after intake so if it's in your system i always say like if it's in your system it's affecting you one way or the other and it goes for food and and supplements and all that sort of stuff as well it's like if it's in your system it's affecting you yeah. so it's it's tough because it's it's if you're not seeing the results right off the bat and we're t- if we talk like you know body shaping and all of that kind of stuff if someone's looking to really get cut and all that that takes time that can take years mm-hmm. just like putting on weight can take years and so uh if you're not seeing the results right off the bat it's very easy to slip back into old ways and old habits because you're like yeah who cares or i'm not seeing it it might not not it's not working you know yeah um it's interesting i actually funny you mentioned your you know, alcohol. Cause I, in 2020, I have never drank so little in my life. And it, I think it played so well with, you know, being in this compromised, you know, life situation, but it had to have helped because, you know, people were struggling, you know, across the board in, in various ways, but I truly contribute like my sustainable happiness to th- that being a factor of that, you know? Um, and it's been great, man. I mean, I, you know, I've been able to enjoy some alcohol in 2021, you know, um, you know, going out more regularly, but, um, I love it though. I've definitely tamed it back and it's, I think it's definitely here to stay for me at least. Yeah. Good for you. That's congratulations. That's a tough one. I mean, it's tough. It's a, I mean, talk about addicting. Well, it's funny, you know, if we're going to talk about substances, it blows me away. Like I, it just blows me away at how readily available some of the most poisonous things on the planet are, but yeah. some things that aren't and it's like taboo and it's all this stuff and lean whatever way you want. I don't really care. Like I have my own personal opinions and they're my own. They're nobody else's. Um, but I just, I personally believe that like having 
having that so readily available and then not these other things and it's huge fines or prison time it's like it, to me it's mind-blowing i'm like yeah to me personally my own personal opinion is everyone should have the right to put whatever they want in their body i don't really care again i have i'm a live and let live kind of guy it's like you do you as long as it doesn't affect me we don't have a problem you know yeah. as long as it doesn't affect me my family you're not out there hurting people my i mind my own business but um you know, alcohol is a tough one for me. Yeah. Co- going back to my childhood, you know, my mom, my mom was a heroin addict. Okay. My mom, you know, she used to tell me stories of doing speed balls and all this other stuff. Like, and I mean, I'm like 15 and she's telling me this stuff, you know, she used to buy me cigarettes. I used to smoke heavily. I mean, wow. nicotine is one of the hardest things on the planet to step away from. And, but you know, by a third or fourth grade, I was smoking a pack a day. You know, wow. I mean, we talk about alcohol and nicotine. I mean, I was destined for doom. I had my first alcoholic beverage at six years old. And um, you talk about substance abuse and that sort of thing. Like it's in my blood. There's no Mm. way around it. You know, I love my dad to death, but he drinks heavily, you know? And so I know that that's probably not the best route for me. And um, to be honest, I, I, after Sochi, I, I started to spiral really heavily like I was doing well I was kind of off and on the alcohol that was something that I was looking at for for health reasons primarily but I also knew like I would I would have a tendency to maybe not make the best decisions and not like I'm gonna go out and drive or hurt somebody but I just get wild you know it's like oh I could backflip off that roof you know or just whatever like you know my my reservations were very low at that when when I'm when I'm drinking and stuff. And I knew that. So going, coming out of Sochi, it was just a giant party. There's nothing I could do. No matter where I went, someone wanted to buy me a drink, you know, whether I was at home, whether I was at, you know, the mountain, wherever, you know, I I had kind of built a name for myself at that point. And, you know, friends would find out I was in town like, Oh, let's go out. So I'd go out and then it's like, let me buy you a drink. And, you know, like I said, I was the, I'm the kind of guy that like, if I have one, I have 30. So, yeah. Um, you know, that went on till about December. So she was in March, December. I mean, you do the math. It was quite some time that I was really struggling with it. And it was pretty much daily. And mind you, I was living at the Olympic Training Center. So I was training hard and all of that. But it, it was like at night was a whole different ballgame. You know, the training center is a dry campus. So, but there's a bar right across the street. Hmm. And um, so it's like, for me, it was just like, after a while it became like, the hair of the dog that bit you, you know, yeah. like kind of just taming that, the hangovers and that kind of thing. And it was just brought to my attention in December that year um, that I, you know, some coaches had noticed that uh, some coaches of mine who were also, you know, mentors, mentors and friends uh, had just noticed that I was having a serious time, hard time, and it was becoming a problem. And, you know, their, their take on it was like, we want to make you a better person not just a better snowboarder not just a better athlete we want to make you a better person all the way around and what that looks like to you might be different than what that looks like to us but either way this doesn't fit yeah and um and you know it was brought to my attention and so um i went home with that in my head and and locked myself in a room for for a couple of weeks and just dealt with it yeah. dealt with it you know and um never in my life did i realize I, I realized never in my life did i crave it more than that that point was taking it away and telling myself i couldn't have it those first few weeks it's all i wanted to do yeah it was the weirdest thing like i'd go to the mountain and never prior to that did, was i like oh i just you know went to the mountain i'm gonna stop and pick up you know a six or twelve pack and and drink in my room by myself but that's what i wanted to do at that point um you know, and that was back in 2014. So, you know, I'm pushing six and a half years, I think, something wow. like that now, you know. Good um, for you. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. Pushing, wait, six and a half. Yeah, six and a half years. Of, this year will be seven years of, of no booze. And, and I couldn't, just like you said, like, best thing I've ever done. Yeah. It feels great. It's here to stay. Like, no hangovers. You know, I'm not, I'm not getting any younger. And the hangovers seem to affect me that much more. So, yeah. Um, or they did back then. So that's probably the best thing. Plus it's just not, it's not something I have to spend money on. I realize it saves so much more money when I go overseas to these crazy places and, you know, 
everyone's celebrating i'm having club sodas guess what most places they're free yeah exactly. and two you see people see a bubbly drink with ice in it and a lemon floating around or whatever like no one's questioning you why you're not drinking or anything yeah um and if they do, I just tell them I got a problem. I'm not exactly I'm not proud of it, but it's also like it's something that I you don't want I'm me to start drinking. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's, exactly. It's better if I don't. So yeah. you know, congrats to you because that's awesome. It's it's hard. It's really hard. It's especially tough. when that's the social norm. Yeah, well, and that's I mean, you realize it's like wow, I've been just peer pressuring myself to drink, you know, or to even you know the original superfood being you know uh, hemp. You know, it's like I've been able to slow down with that and it's just crazy, man. Like, I feel like for me, COVID was a, a really introspective experience, you know, that I, one of my best years of my life. So it's just weird how Good. things take shit, you know, how life takes shit. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you look at it just from a health perspective, I mean, I feel like it's one of the best things you can do is step away from that once in a while. Yeah. You know, and like I said, nicotine also, you know, there's multiple forms of that and, you know, yeah. I mean, I quit smoking cigarettes years and years and years ago, but, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while back in the day, you know, I'd have a snooze or for a while when I was quitting cigarettes, I was doing the, uh, the vaping stuff. And then I kind of got addicted to that. And I was like, dude, this is crazy. Like, that's <laughs> all I want to do. I want to have that in my face all day. Yeah. How, how do I, how do I live in there? Yeah, completely. Right. Right. Um, so that's crazy. So I want to conclude though, with just kind of getting to know, you said you guys getting to know you like on a daily basis, like you said, you know, you don't eat traditionally in the morning. I'm the same way. Like I usually fast until I'm actually hungry. Um, so up until like 12 PM for the most part, what does that look like for you in the morning? Are you working out? Are you eating? Like what's, when do you start eating? I guess. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I like, I like, I like to kind of fast from you know, 8 to 10 p.m. into somewhere in the range of 12, 12 p.m. Uh, I just generally I'm not that hungry in the morning. Um, I love my coffee. Yeah. You know, so I definitely have a couple cups of coffee. Uh, we have our own little espresso machine here at the house. So, you know, we're, we're coffee people. So that's that's my routine. Generally, I get up, have a couple glasses of water, you know, have a coffee, jump on my computer. I'm a full-time program manager for a nonprofit organization. Uh, and so I have a lot of work to do there. And so generally speaking, I don't even realize it, but it's already noon. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm kind of hungry, you know, but yeah. um, if I do have something, it's generally a smoothie or something like that, or, or, you know, an egg with, with smoothies. Uh, and, you know, again, the smoothie thing, that's, that's Heather all the way. She throws yeah. some fruit in there, some spinach, and then some superfoods. And, and, you know, and she, she's like, ah, you'll like it. Trust me. And so do you even know what you're, do. do you even know what you're eating or are you just going with it? Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes not, you know, yeah. uh, I, I, I trust her. So I know like generally it's, we've got acai in there. We've got chia, we've got, uh, uh, matcha, nice. cacao, beetroot, um, that's just a few off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and a lot of things that, that she throws in there has a make, she makes sure it has those omegas and those fatty acids for me. Cause she knows it's kind of important for, for me to stay on, on a path of, of functionality. So, um, yeah, I, I can't say that I always know what we're, what we're doing, but you know, from there it's generally, if I haven't eaten anything other than maybe the smoothie or something like that. I'll have a few eggs, that sort of thing. Um, just get my body going and waking up. And then I just kind of eat throughout the day as, as I, as I feel hungry, I don't try to label anything. I try to stay away from, you can only eat at these times and this amount and all that. I did all of that. I've done, I've done the very strict measurements. And what I found is when you put labels on things, um, you just, and for me, I just want them more. Yeah. Uh, so if I say something is bad or unhealthy, well, for some reason in my brain now i want that yep um or if i say i can only have this amount at this time it's like 20 minutes before half hour before an hour before i want that and then or i want double of that when it's time you know and so for me i just kind of take things as they come you know i snack on nuts and and, and various things like that i try to have a good balance throughout the day uh of, of carbs sugars fats 
and proteins. That's, I mean, those are the four major ones, you know, and I try to, I try to mix it up, make sure that, you know, I have a good balance with every meal. If I am going to have a meal, um, if it's an afternoon lunch, you know, I try to make sure if it's, if it's a protein, you know, there's some vegetables in there and there's a light carb in there as well. I try to, what I found from doing the keto thing was like, I felt great, but I was losing too much weight. And so for me, I had to add carbs back into my diet. Um, so that for me, that was like, okay, I have to do that. How can I do that on a, on a healthy scale? And, you know, that might be, you know, a slice of bread or something like that. Nothing crazy. I don't go, I try not to go too crazy. And then dinner, you know, it's, it's a, it's a moderate meal, but it's nothing. Again, it's, if I go heavy on anything, I probably go a little bit heavier on the protein side, just to keep my weight where I would want it, keep my body where I want to keep my, you know, my inflammation and that sort of stuff where I want it, you know, and, sure. and then, you know, for us, no booze, um, yeah. try to keep my sugars within, within reason, especially at night, I get those late night sweet cravings. So got to be careful with that. Um, and do you cut off yeah, food at, at night at a certain time too? Yeah. No later than 10 o'clock okay. ever. Like that, that's the rule of thumb. I, I generally after dinner, like if I'm going to have a dessert, I try to have it as close to the meal as possible versus waiting an hour till I'm kind of starting to feel hungry again, because then, you know, your body's already started to process what was put in and that might get put on the back burner till the next day, if at all. So, you know, I want it to all kind of be lumped together it's kind of my, my thought process on it. Whereas if I give it time, then, you know, it's always in stages, how your body works. At least from what I found out is like, if it starts to burn everything that it's eating in there, you put some more fuel in there an hour later. Well, now that's going towards the reserve tank than what's, what's actually being burned in there. So, wow. yeah, I try to, I try to cut it off eight, eight thirty. you know, um, no later than 10, if it's crazy. And I'm just like, dude, I gotta have some milk and cookies or something. Okay. But if it's after 10, it's like, you just need to go to bed. Yeah, totally. Any, like any smoothies that you like, like any favorite smoothie of yours or any favorite snack of yours that like I need to make today? Uh, as far as making yeah, yeah. smoothies all day. I mean, I love pineapple. Okay. It, it's a sugary fruit. So okay. I love pineapple just in general. And I love that Hawaiian taste. Like, you know, those Hawaiian flavors, like banana, strawberry, pineapple, okay. uh, you know, that's kind of my go-to if I'm like, yo, I want some sweet along with, along with that, that delicious smoothie. But I always try to make sure to mix some, some of those powders in as yeah. well and mix in, mix in some of the, the greens and stuff. And, um, what kind of greens do you use? Yeah. So uh, primarily spinach. Okay. Spinach is a big one for us. Kale is tough because it's so like, so leafy. You yeah. Know, it's really hard for even, even I found even with a Vitamix, it's like, there's still enough particles where they, for me, I like, I want to chew it and I'm a texture guy. So like, yeah. I don't like things getting stuck in my teeth. I don't like having to chew things if I'm trying to drink it, that sort of stuff. So spinach is primarily the green there. I might throw some avocado in there once in a while, some great yeah. fats there. Okay. Um, and then what, what liquid base know. do you use? Like water or you go with a milk, like a, a plant-based milk? Yeah. So uh, if Heather's making it, it's almost always a nut milk. I okay. personally, I do like whole milk because I am trying to get those fats away from the sugars kind of deal. You go skim milk or something like that. You're just drinking sugar water. That's white. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but if Heather's making it for sure, it's a nut milk. It's either an almond milk, a macadamia milk, um, a cashew milk, something like a cashew milk is awesome because it's a little bit sweeter. Yeah. Just naturally. If you, if you go, no, no sugar, whatever. Cashew milk is a little bit sweeter, which is nice. Um, sometimes she'll do a little bit of the acai juice. It's a mix of the nut milk juice, juice mix. So there's, you know, some good base. And then I, for me, like, I kind of like my smoothies. If it's not frozen, like a, like a Slurpee style texture, then I want it. I want it liquid. I want a true liquid. So I'll add water to mine and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, you, hemp milk is one of the easiest things I've been doing. Well, just like I'll add maybe four tablespoons of hemp seeds. And then it's, I think it's a cup or two of water Blend it up and you're good to go. Um, Oh yeah. And talk yeah. about omegas. I mean, it's, it's rich. So yeah. 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 And, and shameless plug here. I'm just going to throw this it. up, you know. Oh, we, dude, look at throw, that. I love dude, it. This stuff is legit. Yeah, this stuff right? Is legit. If, 
if you're looking to have greens in your smoothie and that yeah. sort of thing, and you don't want foliage in there whatsoever, I mean, yeah. throw a scoop of this stuff in there and it's amazing. You know, I just shameless plug Navitas. I know, love like, it. Super grateful for you guys hooking, hooking us up with this stuff. Oh my God. It, not only is it like invaluable, but it goes really, really far. I mean, a teaspoon, a tablespoon a day kind of deal. I mean, that's, that's all you need. Yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, our sorry, bodies can only, do dude, I love it. Our bodies can only handle so much protein, right? So it's like, I think the serving size has 10 grams of protein plus all those superfoods, greens, like it's got every, it's the perfect product. I love that thing. It's a great blend too, especially if you're just adding, if you're doing fruit and you're like, okay, I, I want to have everything and I don't want to have to measure out five, six, seven different powders. One scoop of that. Yeah. Boom. And you're good to you're, go. You've covered all your bases. Totally. Well, I'll tell you, I'm tr definitely going to add pineapple. To, I had never add pineapple to my smoothie and I totally will be going forward. So like, if you're doing like a, you know, we have whole pineapples and they're pretty cheap. Yeah. You can't say they're the most expensive fruit. So it's nice. You know, we just cut them up. But if you do go like with a canned pineapple, make sure it's in juice versus syrup. I would just suggest that. Um, yeah. And if you, you know, you can use the juice as a base as well. If you're trying to have that sweeter, juicier, you know, you're not really worried about the sugar content. It is high in sugar. Yeah. Um, use a little of that juice in your base and it's, it's good to go. But pineapple, I mean, that, that's a natural sweetener across the board. Bananas, if you, you know, you let them ripen up a little bit, that's another natural sweetener. Um, yeah. Blueberries, again, if you let them sweeten up a little bit there. So you can get your sugars in more of a natural form versus man, this is, this is so bitter. This is so tart. I need to add something in there, honey or something. I love it. So last question, do you, do you have like goals in mind for the future? Like the, like top, like one or two goals right now that you're thinking about incorporating into your diet? This, you know, this coming I year? just want to live as long as possible, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so fun. If I may, I was just going to talk a little bit longer. I know we're going to wrap up. Yeah, here, go but... for it. I was thinking a while back, I can't remember, I was having a conversation with someone. Have you ever seen the show Love Connection? Back in I've the day, it was like 80s, it. 90s. Okay, so a lot of people had, and I was I was telling some, some of the younger athletes, I think it was, I was like, you guys see this show, it was like a dating show in like the 90s, and it was by this guy named Chuck Woolery. He was like the, he was he was the guy, he was uh, the, the host. And so I was Googling it and just laughing because I was looking at it and I was like, they they do these profiles this is tim and he's a construction worker at 32 and blah 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 this is all of his things and then this is jason and he likes to ride horses and whatever you know it's like their whole little profile and it's like a video thing and um i was looking at these guys and they're like 32 34 28 and they look like they were late 40s mid 50s and i'm going man dude the 80s and 90s were not kind to people you know yeah um and Talk so like, substance. right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're looking at these guys and it's like, okay, in the coming through the eighties, maybe early nineties, like life expectancy was what 50, 60, 70. And like, at that point you are dirt old. Like you better have lived your life by about 40, 45. Cause after that, it's all downhill. And now you're looking at people. I mean, look at Joe Rogan, for example, guys, what 52, 53, something like that. And I mean, he's a beast. He's an animal. And like, you see a lot of that these days, people becoming more health conscientious and, and aware of what they're putting in their bodies and understanding that there's like this whole, it's all relative, right? It's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the mental wealth, you know, stretching, exercise, food, diet, uh, all of it. It's like, it's all encompassed into this. And so I was just thinking about it when I saw that, that, love connection i was like man like tim is looking rough at 32 <laughs> and he's he's a couple years younger than me and i'm still doing athletics with some some young guys that are some of the best in the world so uh i just want to live longer i want to yeah. live as long as possible i'm a, i i i have this serious case of fomo like i want to see what the future holds for everyone and um that would be my like ultimate long long-term goal i want to see my son grow up and be you know something awesome and do do his life however he sees fit and and uh, i want to see him be successful and have kids so long term you know that would be it short term you know we're going into the games next season i want to make it to beijing i want to go win two gold medals Sweet. i want to i want to you know crush crush it there um you know and then midterm is just have a good life be productive in society be productive in my personal life 
continue on with my interpersonal relationships. Uh, just started doing jujitsu recently. And no so way. I want to keep doing that. Yeah. It's cool, man. That's I was a wrestler in high school. And so it's for me, it's like just rolling with, with people and stuff and with the gym opening back up and stuff. It's like, this is rad. You know, it's just another way for me to kind of stay fit, feel young, get a workout in, you know, learn some stuff, um, you know, get, getting choked out, getting choked <laughs> yeah. out is like, you, some things just don't seem so important yeah exactly <laughs> you yeah. know um so those are i would say lo nice. long term short term and then Mid you know term. middle of the road it's yeah. just be a good human i just that's my goal is to be be prosperous be a good human give my family a good life have a good life enjoy it while it lasts because what i've learned is life is short uh there's yeah. no guarantee tomorrow's gonna come and you know, so enjoy it while, while you got it. I love it. Well, piggybacking off longevity, I've been uh, really into blue zone diets. I don't know if you know much about that. Um, my mom is Greek and, um, I, um, blue zone Mediterranean diets basically are, you know, they, they promote longevity. So I've been learning a lot about, you know, incorporating whole grains, nuts, things like that. And, uh, it's just been incredible. So I urge you to check it out if you haven't, if you don't know much about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have heard about it. And I think even on that, on that note, something about like removing yourself from technology from time to time and all of that, right. That kind of plays into that whole, uh, lifestyle change. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, correct. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thanks for joining me. It was awesome talking to you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked. Yeah, man. And all the, all the best to you. And, and I, I hope you, you know, this becomes a huge thing and, and, you have a ton of success with it. I appreciate it, dude. Uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, dude, Keith. Yeah, man.